Asha, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to address all of you. And um, although I will be making a few general remarks and observations um, about Buddhism and the Buddhist tradition and how it relates um, to the area of education, um, which is a subject um, that I'm very interested in and devoted to myself. Um, understanding that in your own lives, um, your efforts to promote GNH in the um, national curriculum um, is, is one which is taking a more secular approach, then I, I would try to express myself in those more general um, secular terms whenever I can. Um, but to begin with, um, I, I would like to uh, repeat a point I've been making in a number of places since, since I arrived. Um, and, it, and it is um, an, an observation um, of the religious traditions in the world. The religions that grew up in the Middle East, particularly the great monotheistic religions of Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam, um, are, um, we, are, we often refer to them as the great faiths. And that in itself points to the essence or the essential feature, the, uh, the prime virtue promoted by those religions is faith. And we, re we can refer to those religions as belief systems. And as Western culture is the dominant culture in the world today, the understanding of religion is very much influenced by the uh, Western viewpoint, uh, which is uh, as I say, developed in the midst of these faith-based religions or um, belief systems, to the extent uh, to which the word religion is used as a general term, and we are led to understand that all religions um, are basically the same thing. They're all doing the same job. They might use some different terms but they're all essentially um, trying to teach the same values and lead to the same goals. Now, I, I would um, say very uh, bluntly here that I don't agree with that. I don't think it's an accurate, it's an ideal. It would be very nice, I, I would think, if there was that kind of harmony, but I, I don't think it's the case. Um, the people who most enthusiastically um, um, talk about the unity of religions are, are usually the ones that know, know the least about them. The, I, I would say in particular that Buddhism is a very different kind of religion. I always call it a different species of religion and that we run a great danger of misunderstanding our own Buddhist heritage and, and of not deriving the benefit that we should derive from our Buddhist heritage when we see it as a belief system, as a faith. Um, I would say that the use of the word the Buddhist faith is already um, an inaccurate and incorrect um, appellation. So my proposal is that, that Buddhism is essentially an education system. If you look at the Buddhist texts and compare it with the, the Bible, the Quran, the texts of other religions, there is a huge difference in the content, the style, um, in almost in every aspect of, of those books. Now, um, speaking of, of Buddhism um, in particular, um, we can say that it's founded upon um, the human being. It's not concerned with creating 
a particular or correct relationship between the human, uh, the human being and the divine. Um, it is based upon a belief in the capacity of the human being for enlightenment and the capacity of the human being uh, for um, education and for transformation. If we compare human beings with most animals, we see a significant difference. Most animals um, are self-sufficient within a very short time, some within hours, some within days, some within months. Uh, they learn everything they need to learn from their parents and their environment to enable them to survive for the rest of their life. Human beings take years and years um, before um, they are self-sufficient. And they don't just learn what they need to survive in a very early period um, and then just make use of that knowledge. But we have the ability, the capacity for lifetime learning. And what Buddhism says is that our humanity uh, lies in that capacity, in our ability, our capacity for lifetime learning. It's what makes us truly human. And the kind of um, learning which is considered most essential to um, our happiness and, and welfare is the understanding of how to abandon all of the negative qualities within us, how to develop and to bring to maturation all the positive qualities and how to purify our minds. The, uh, the summation of this Buddhist um, scheme of education of every aspect of our, of our lives, of body, speech and mind, is what we call enlightenment. And the enlightened being was called by the Buddha the Aseka Pukala. And we can translate that into English very simply as the graduate. Someone who has graduated from life. Uh, so the enlightened person is the only true graduate. And Everyone else um, is learning. So Buddhism teaches us to perceive ourselves, to look at ourselves as learners. We're learning. And how that applies, in, uh, particularly in an educational context, is that uh, we don't look at a school or a college as being composed of teachers and learners or students, but as different kinds of students. So you have um, one group of students is called the pupil, are called the pupils. The second group of students are called the teachers. And the third group of students are called the parents. And this education process will, will really thrive when we're able to instill that idea that just as um, the pupil is encouraged never to be complacent but constantly seeking to develop more and more then similarly the teacher is never uh, should never be complacent about his knowledge and teaching skills um, and particularly um, when when we also introduce the idea of teachers as role models then uh, becomes even more um, essential that the teacher uh, is constantly um, perceiving himself or herself as a student of life. And thirdly, um, we need to be able to bring the parents in also, that they are students. They are students of life, but they are also students themselves, students of how to be um, good uh, sons and daughters themselves, if they still have living parents, how, how to be good parents, how to be good spouses, how to be good human beings. So um, this is why you know, I think that uh, of the great religious traditions, um, Buddhism 
um, is offers unparalleled um, resources for an education system and one which is grounded upon Buddhist psychological principles um, will um, be very effective because the Buddha was the person who plumbed the, the profound depths of human uh, nature. There is no uh, religious tradition, no philosophical tradition which has even a tiny percentage of the insights into the nature of human consciousness that the Buddhist tradition um, possesses. On one occasion, uh, the, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, in a meeting um, with Western academics, referred not not slightingly and not uh, you know patronizingly, but um, listening to a, a presentation on Western psychology, he said. This is baby psychology. You know, it's like it's like this is so basic compared with uh, what is taught in the in the Buddhist traditions. So this is a wonderful resource that we have. Now, um, speaking in particular on the um, development of of GNH and GNH values in the school system in Bhutan, for instance. Um, one thing I, I think to um, be wary of is that most traditions teach uh, virtues that we should possess. And indeed, many traditions will tell us, you should be la, you should be like this, you should be like that. You should not be like this. You should not be like that. A good person is kind and unselfish and sharing, and a bad person is greedy and so on and so forth. So we all heard this so many times, haven't we? Who, what we should be like and what we should not be like. And maybe that's the way that we teach our children and our students. You should be like this and you should be like that. But the simple um, point, the problem that remains is that we're so very rarely given any tools, any practical everyday means to promote positive qualities and to remove the obstacles to their development. And if that's the case, then we're always in the realm of ideals. You know, we can, we can comfort ourselves. You say, well, yes, we teach kindness, we teach compassion, we teach unselfishness, we teach honesty, and really believe that we are teaching them, when in fact all we're doing is telling people, you should be kind, you should be compassionate, you should be this and you should be that. So psychologically, um, it's uh, naive and ineffective, and what can often happen is that people who are constantly taught in that way start to feel, I'm hopeless, I'm bad, I should be this and I'm not, you know, um, and feel very discouraged. So what I feel that the Buddhist tradition has to offer, um, and it, it can be also be offered in a, in a very... Um, non-Buddhist idiom, if we, if we wish for that, if we feel that's necessary, um, are uh, specific uh, technologies, specific methods and techniques of embodying, of bringing into real life the kinds of ideals that we uphold. Um, so, I'm, I'm going to give you, uh, you know, a few um, pointers and observations and um, principles. Firstly, that although um, in English we, um, we often use the word meditation, the, uh, the Buddha himself, um, surprisingly perhaps, um, never used that word. The word that the Buddha used most commonly is pavana, uh, which means um, cultivation. 
or development. And the Buddha didn't confine it to um, spiritual development um, uh, as such, but pointed out that any human development, positive development or cultivation must be a holistic, organic development, one which encompasses every aspect of our lives. If we don't grasp this particular point, all that meditation will provide us, and in fact it's not a small thing at all, um, and that it is stress reduction. But um, meditation as a transformative tool in our lives um, will only uh, really come about when it is integrated with a whole attitude to life, a whole system of development. The Buddha made very clear that um, morality is the indispensable foundation for spiritual growth. And here um, um, also um, perhaps carrying on from the point I made about the uniqueness of the Buddhist tradition um, is that whereas if we look in a rather superficial way at the precepts that lay Buddhists uphold and compare it with the commandments in the Christian tradition or the rules of, of other traditions, we can see more or less the same thing. But there are some very crucial differences here. Um, one is that there is no reward and punishment system in Buddhism. There's no deity going to give you a reward if you lead a moral life, and there's no one going to punish you um, if you lead an immoral life. There's um, the, uh, the leading of a moral life in the Buddhist tradition um, is one which must come about voluntarily. If there's any sense of external compulsion or if one is acting, conducting oneself in a particular way um, purely for a desire for material advancement or prestige or position or praise, then um, it will be quite a good thing sometimes, but it will not be the kind of morality which is a training, which is a form of education. So the Buddhist um, approach is that precepts are forms of education. So if we take the basic um, precepts, we can say, I undertake to educate my conduct by refraining from killing and harming living beings. I undertake to educate my conduct through refraining from taking anything which is not freely given to me. I make, a, I take a, make an undertaking to, um, to educate, to train my conduct through refraining from adultery and sexual misconduct and so on. Now the idea behind this is one again <coughs> confidence in our capacity to act wisely and to train ourselves. We start off by asking ourselves what kind of family, what kind of community, what kind of society would we like to live in? What kind of society would we like our children to grow up in? What would, the, uh, what would be the, like, the bottom line that we would say we can, uh, we can feel um, relieved and confident in the safety of our children, the well-being of our children? I think one of the, um, the, the kinds of answers, and I've asked many groups of people in many different places this kind of question is, we need to feel that um, we're physically safe, that we're not going to be physically oppressed 
hurt, abused. We need to have some sense of security for our property. We need to have some sense of security um, and freedom from worry that someone uh, will try to take our partner, our loved one, away from us. Or that our partner is, um, is having affairs behind our back. Uh, we need to feel um, that sense of trust and relaxation that, um, that when people speak to us that they're telling the truth and they're not lying and cheating us. We need, we, we'd like to live in communities where we feel people are responsible for their actions, not under the influence of alcohol and drugs. So, if we have certain basic principles for a healthy society, a society in which we can trust each other, in which we feel secure, in which we feel some affection and care for each other, the next step from that is, what are the practical steps that we can take to promote the kind of families and communities that we would like to live in. And here, the, the Buddha suggests that we draw upon a universal human quality or gift, and that is the ability to refrain. Now, you can see with, most anim with animals that that's not possible. If you have a cat that likes to chase rats and eat them, you know, even if that cat um, has a lot of affection for you and listens to you, and even if you could speak cat language, I don't think you could get that cat to stop chasing rats because its instincts are so powerful. Now, human beings, we also have those kinds of instincts for survival, for sex, for procreation, all these kinds of instincts, and they're not evil. But we do have the ability to stand back from our animal instincts and make judgments. Well, I won't do this. Well, do you want to do it? Oh, yes. Well, why not do it? Oh, well, it would be so hurtful to that person or it wouldn't be right, I just wouldn't feel right to do that. So this is a basic human um, uh, quality we have, it's a wonderful quality, where in certain circumstances we can say, I won't follow my instincts, I won't do this, I won't say that, because um, it, would be, it would create problems and consequences suffering for myself and others, it's not worth it, basically. So, in the moral realm, if we voluntarily take upon ourselves certain boundaries and certain restrictions, and we can maintain our conduct within those restrictions, we have the basis for self-respect. We have the basis for uh, healthy, supportive communities um, externally and internally we have the self-respect and self-esteem necessary for further spiritual practice. In this question of self-esteem the other main pillar supporting that sense of self-respect and self-esteem is generosity. When we act generously when we give, when we share with others, we see immediately that we, just little old me, we may not have a very high opinion of ourselves, but we can see through certain actions and certain speech, we can reduce, even by a little bit, someone else's suffering. We can increase, even by a little bit, someone else's happiness. And we say, I'm, just not, I'm not just nothing in this world. I'm not a meaningless, uh, a bit of driftwood. I make a positive yeah, impact on the world I live in, even if it's in very modest ways. So generosity and a voluntary acceptance of boundaries for conduct, these are the foundations for an effective meditation practice. They can, if you are not acting in that way, 
um, you won't be a friend to yourself. You won't have self-respect and the kind of perseverance um, and effort needed to be successful in meditation practice uh, will not be accessible to you. As you start to put effort into meditation practice, you begin to think, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve peace. I don't deserve this. Why? Because I'm such a bad person. I'm always doing things that make other people unhappy. And I'm always this. No, I'm such a bad person. I can't do this. I don't deserve to be able to do it. So these are the kind of the psychological impediments to spiritual practice which are very strong in people who are not careful about the quality of their actions and speech. Now given um, that we are putting effort in our daily life to be kind and generous and to, uh, and to be mindful and aware of our actions and speech, next thing is a, like a daily meditation practice. Now for meditation to be a transformative um, element of our lives, yeah, it, it cannot just be one or two minutes um, a day. Um, there, for the real work of meditation to take place, um, you need much you need a much greater um, investment of time and energy. Just um, to digress um, a little bit, a book that I would uh, recommend people read, not a Buddhist book, but a book of general interest, a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, um, which is a book dealing with the uh, conditions underlying success. Uh, and he relates in one chapter of this book uh, that he... Um, uh, let me see how, that in a study at one of the leading music schools in America so the schools are all, uh, these children or these students are already quite proficient um, in their um, musical uh, talents were divided into three groups the really gifted the moderately gifted and the lesser gifted and then they um, did some research on how many hours a day these children practiced. Now the assumption would be that the gifted children, um, the ones that just from birth have found everything very easy, um, would need to practice and would practice much less than the lesser gifted children um, who have to make up for their lack of inherent um, ability through hard work. What they found was that it was exactly the opposite. The more gifted the student, the more hours a day they practiced. And the, um, a, a theory was developed from these studies that for true proficiency, for true excellence, in any skill, you need to make an investment of about 10,000 hours. So, that's a, so um, if you're meditating one or two minutes a day, um, try and work out how many years or lifetimes before you get your 10,000 hours. Um, so now I'd like to just to give you a few um, pointers about meditation practice um, because there doesn't seem to be much clarity about this. Now, um, initially, meditation is an effort to increase attention span. These days, attention spans are becoming shorter and shorter. And it's a major problem in education systems everywhere. And the more, as Bhutan develops, um, physically and materially, you will find that um, the attention span of children declines unless there are um, 